Um, you hear? As you've heard, I've practiced this area of mine for more years than I should have admitted. Uh, this is the first experience for me. I have never had this, what I consider to be an extraordinary opportunity to comment on an area of the law that's very important, has been very important, and, and very impactful to me by uh, someone who was created for you. Um, so there we are. I, 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 I didn't know I would see Gord today. I deliberately decided not to speak to him before today, and I deliberately decided not to see the play. I didn't want to have any prejudgments either from him or, or what I observed. I sort of wanted to do it with, with you. And if there's time after the play, if you're still not exhausted, maybe we can, we can get some feedback in that way. But I, I, I got to tell you, and I know it'll embarrass him, but I don't care. Uh, he's to be congratulated for the extraordinary treatment of, of a very, very important subject in our society, and that's sexual abuse to the, the students by teachers, or alleged sexual abuse. So the consequences of that, what the ramifications of that. I haven't seen lawyers experienced in that area deal with, 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 with this subject matter with as much insight as Gord has. So he won't tell me how long, and he won't tell me what his research was, <laughs> but it certainly was effective. Um, you know what they say, public speaking 101, you're supposed to warm up the audience with a joke. <laughs> Probably already did that, but. <laughs> so I went to my favorite research assistant, Google, and I Googled actor lawyer, joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he came back and said yes. No. <laughs> but what he did, he came back with only one joke. <laughs> And it was rated at the very bottom of the joke rating scale. <laughs> I didn't know there was one. And the joke is this. What do doctors and lawyers have in common? Two vowels. Oh. <laughs> the other thing I did is I googled plays, actors, lawyers. And that came up zero. But I found a review from the New York Times in 1999 that the headline is, Lawyers and Actors, quote, dead on targets. And let me just read you a couple of sentences. George Larkin's new comedy, Dead Lawyers, presented by the Sacred Fools Theater Company, is a fluffy piece that targets an easy mark, but doesn't quite hit a bullseye. And then he finishes by saying, this is a slight offering made better by top-rate technical aspects and perhaps best enjoyed in the company of lawyers with good sense of humor, if they exist. <laughs> as you may know and as you're going to find out in the, in the next hour, it, it, at least to me, the theme of this play is an exploration of the boundaries of a relationship between a teacher and a student, when that student happens to be an athletic prodigy with a, uh, a very uh, uh, optimistic uh, uh, opportunity for future uh, success, and when that teacher is her coach, mentor, the tool by which this student may become or may reach her full potential. And then what happens when one or both of them become involved romantically or sexually or at least are alleged to have been? Who does it affect? How does it affect them? And what's the current state of, uh, of affairs in our society in dealing with those issues? They're examined from three contexts, as you probably know, and I've never seen this done before, and that's the most fascinating. The context are the dynamic between a teacher and his wife, and then the dynamic between the teacher and his lawyer, something that I have some identity with, and then the dynamic between the teacher and the student after an extended period of time has passed. 
I've never known that <coughs> to have happened. I'm sure it has. You just don't find out about it. And so I was most fascinated with that. Um, you should know that the standard of, of the standard of care, the standard of uh, performance, the standard imposed on teachers vis-a-vis -vis their students in this kind of context is very high. One might say today it's almost strict liability. If the allegation is made, instead of our common law presumption of innocent until proven guilty, there's a presumption that it happened. And there is a rallying around and a comforting of the victim. And the teacher can seek his support, etc., from his union or whatever else. And I will confess, back in the 90s, that far is that long? Yeah. I had the bias, I had the opposite bias. As a lawyer who represented school boards, my instinct was to circle the wagons and rally behind and not to admit anything. And I had great difficulty, I had difficulty over a number of years coming to re coming to accept that if this thing was going to work, we really going to effectively deal with sexual abuse of students. We had to have the opposite view. We had to presume the truth. Does that have, does that give us difficulty in some context? Maybe. Is it unfair to some teachers in some circumstances? Maybe. It's a cost of doing business. Uh, if I am caught in a relationship like that, my profession will disbar me. I'm subject to the same, and that's how it should be. If I can't hold out myself to be to a higher standard than perhaps uh, uh, society, the rest of society, then I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I happen to believe that of teachers, or for teachers. Um, however, um, I'm not supposed to give away the plot, and I won't. <laughs> Especially with Gord here, because he's bigger than I am. That's what my wife does every time I say that. I won't, and, and, and I think, but in so doing, I will deal more with the generic of the issues, and I hope you'll understand that. I still hope it gives you a context with which you can view the play uh, perhaps differently than you might have otherwise. Um, I'm going to stay with you and see the play, because I'm, I'm dying to. And I don't have anywhere else to go this afternoon <laughs> because it's Halloween. I don't mean that pejoratively, but if you know what my wife does for Halloween, you know why I'm here. Uh, but I'd love to, uh, to entertain any questions you might have at the, at the end if, if you still have the stamina. Okay, what, where did this standard of care begin in our society? Well, it won't surprise you to know that, and, and, and you know, we're, we operate under the common law system of, of, uh, of law, which was imported or exported by the British. Um, in the 1900s, no, the 19th century, and not surprised, certainly the early part of that 19th century, there was no, there were no rules. It was children in any context, a, a residential context or a class context, were open season. And we can only imagine what went on, and all you have to do, I guess, is refer to the Catholic Church and its experience, and it's particularly with residential schools, to, to have some insight. Towards the latter part of that century, though, there started to develop vis-a-vis -vis the role of educator and the relationship with the student, a concept which the Romans called in loco parentis, meaning you're standing in the place of the parent. And that evolved to today, it's now called reasonably prudent parent. But what it means essentially is that your obligation to as a teacher, to prevent your students from harm is as it would be if it was your child. 
with one complication. You're, you've got a large family, 37. Principal might have 1,100. The Board of Education has got however many thousands are within its, its boundaries. And that has driven the law, uh, including <coughs> the, the law of professional conduct, misconduct, uh, to where we are today. What you need to know as you observe the play, and there are three levels of consequences arising from what you're going to see in the play. And what I mean by that is by the, the, the conduct or the alleged conduct of the teacher. Criminal, civil, and professional. And they can occur alone or in any combination of, with the other two. Um, they usually, they, the, the most usual are the latter two, the civil and the professional. Uh, criminal, unless the, the circumstances are extraordinary, vis-a-vis -vis the harm that has come to the victim, etc., and the length of time it's gone on. But the criminal is, is rarely used, more out of deference and, and considered to be in the best interest of the victim. Why put somebody through that again? Um, one of the things you're going <coughs> to you're going to be hearing about is the age of consent to sexual activity. Uh, the age of consent in Canada is 16. In the context of teacher-student, there are no exceptions. There are no defenses. The number of offenses that exist within our criminal code, they surprise you, are varied and, and numerous. They include sexual interference, sexual assault, sexual exploitation, invitational to sexual touch, and um, uh, sexual assault speaks for itself. Sexual assault is where there is contact between the two in a manner that is deemed to be sexual. It can be as <clears throat> it can be as brief as a a hand on a behind or a hand on an upper thigh to sexual intercourse. The consequences of that are severe and the maximum penalty is 14 years in prison. Sexual exploitation is when there is and when uh, the teacher in this case attempts to, by words or by, by uh, actions, lure the student into a sexual uh, uh, circumstance. The, again, the maximum penalty of that is, what, is seven years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The most common offenses that apply to the teacher situation, particularly the one you're going to see, are sexual interference, sexual exploitation. All actions short of touching, if you will, but all designed to groom that student to become a sexual partner of the teacher. Now there are lots of, of uh, myths going on within the teaching profession about what is what is safe to do and what is not. And I guess I've had experience with the full spectrum. Some teachers still believe that if you wait until the student has turned 18, becomes an adult, that a relationship thereafter is perfectly fine. Whether or not that, per that, that student is still <coughs> in a teaching relationship or has moved on to higher education or the workforce. That's absolutely wrong. The strict liability is you do not have any sexual conduct. You do not engage in any sexual activity vis-a-vis -vis a teacher, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a student. While that person is your student and for a period of time thereafter. There's no, and there's no magic period of time. 
unions will say one to two year, one year, no more. Lawyers on the other side will say minimum of two years. And it really depends on what impact the teacher's conduct had while the teaching relationship existed on the victim. And naturally, the greater the impact, the longer the healing period, the longer that period will be. Um, some, again, and I've touched upon that, some teachers think as long as the teaching relationship has terminated and moved on, I can then engage. No, wrong. As I say, the one to two to perhaps longer period of time prevails. Um, fortunately, given our state of statutory and common law, particularly in Ontario, uh, that, and I don't, I don't mean this particularly in the teaching profession, but there is a growing and, 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 and flourishing realization within that profession that the strict liability standard is the one that, that should apply. Certainly since the Ontario College of Teachers was created, um, this, has, this has come forward at a greater and a more acceptable pace. So that's criminal. Civil. Civil is a private legal proceeding commenced by a private citizen against another private citizen or uh, a public institution, as the case may be. The most frequent legal proceeding arising out of a sexual relationship of the type you're going to see and, and I described is a civil suit. It's an action commenced on behalf of the student, sometimes with the parent's direct involvement as a party, because they, they do have the compensable rights in some circumstances in this circumstance. And the action is always commenced against the teacher, the principal, and the Board of Education. The allegations against the teacher are sexual abuse. That's the civil cause of action and everything that, and, and, and the spectrum of actions are that, as I've described for it, could be anything to the, the, you know, a faint laying on of hands to the suggestion of, or the invitation to, or the discussion of. The allegations against the principal and the school board, or the, and the cause of act, is breach of duty. Remember I mentioned in loco parentis, the obligation to keep them from harm? Well, the allegation in that action would be you failed to do that. And the teacher was right under your nose, and you knew or you ought to have known and taken steps to prevent. I have yet to, I have yet to learn of a school board who successfully defended one of those allegations. Um, for lots of reasons, I guess. Um, I just want to stop and say something. It's not part of the play, but it's it's a profound circumstance in, in, in this area, and that's the healing power of an apology. I've represented many school boards in defending these actions. I've advised school boards who are being defended by lawyers for insurance companies in these type of actions, and I've seen a lot of it. And. The concept of apology is a relatively new one in the legal profession. I used to have a mantra, never admit, never apologize. Well, that's not no longer the case, <coughs> particularly in these type of situations. The, the profound beneficial impact of an apology to the victim is very important, whether it be uh, personally, person to person, or whether it be in the context of a legal proceeding. Perhaps the most um, impactful one on me is, is uh, was a, a discipline of a English teacher. And the victim was, at the time of uh, the alleged event, 15. Age of consent was 14 then. And she was a ward of, she was a crown ward. Nobody believed her. 
and nobody would pay attention to her. And this event, and, and, and the disclosure of the relationship, what happened is the teacher took out his clothes, crawled in the bed naked with him, and tried to have sex with him. This wasn't disclosed until 18 years after the actual event. And you know why? Because in, in 2000, the provincial legislature passed a knack to protect students in these type of situations. And for the first time, it imposed a positive obligation on the teaching profession to disclose knowledge of these type of events. And so teachers who knew and understood the legislation that were harboring these memories, many of them came forward. And that's why in 2002 to 2005, there was a flood of these cases going way back. In any event, that's what the disclosure was made. And and, and I didn't know until the day this student, now an adult with children, was going to even testify. She just didn't want anything to do with it. I persuaded her to come to the courtroom. I persuaded her to, to, to at least take the stand. And then we'd see what would happen. Well, we took the stand. I had some preliminary questions of her. And then I asked her the magic question. Tell me what happened that day. And she refused to tell me. And so I did what is available to me. I, I hate this phrase, but it's what it is. I had her declared a hostile witness, and I cross, was able to cross-examine her. And I, uh, I think I only got a couple of questions in, and she said to me, nobody cares. Nobody's ever cared. And I don't know why I did it. But I said, you're wrong. On behalf of me, on behalf of my client, on behalf of this board of arbitration, I'm sorry. She broke down in tears and told us the whole story. Um, as I say, that's one of the most impactful events. I had a, and I hope I don't take enough time, but these things, I think, they bring good lessons. I represented a very small school board in northern uh, Ontario that uh, allegations were made by a native female student age 15 against the head of the history class of the school, whose wife was chair of the Board of Education. Right. Well, you know where that bias was. And I was called by the director who said, what do I do? And I gave him the advice that, that I've been describing. And I said, give her every benefit of the doubt. And, and nurture. Well, he tried, but it didn't work. And that student was in her OAC year, the year it happened, and she was ostracized by her peers and by the teaching staff. So much so that the guidance teacher refused to process her application that OAC students have to send in by February so they're eligible for acceptance of call. Refused. And what happened on the day of the trial? He walked in the courtroom and pleaded guilty to seven counts of sexual assault. And then she brought her action. We tried to resolve it by mediation. First time face to face in a room with a mediator. And the first thing I said is how sorry I am, and we settled it within a half an hour, not because I'm a great negotiator, but because that person was placed in a frame of mind where she needed to get this behind her and move on. And she graduated successfully from New York University and is now a teacher herself. Um, there's a process that occurs now automatically, thank God, when an allegation is is made public of uh, sexual impropriety by a teacher. And that process is the teacher is immediately removed from the classroom, immediately removed from any context where he or she may become in contact with students. Usually it's sent home on a home assignment. The, the board conducts an investigation to determine the likelihood of events, makes a decision, and then makes a decision on discipline. And that decision is, I, probably imagine is now, it, it is 
much more frequently that of, um, of uh, professional misconduct than not. 99% of the time, the discipline is termination. Get that person out of the teaching context forever. Now, in the bad old days, not bad old days, the 80s, there used to be a gradual uh, uh, escalation of discipline if the teacher was a repeat offender. And in any event, over a period of time, the discipline evolved. Back in the early 80s, if evidence came to the attention of a principal or a school board, uh, a teacher committing such an act, it was usually a closed door meeting and a light reprimand. Don't do it again. Send the teacher back to the classroom. After a few years, that reprimand turned it into a suspension and transfer to another class. A few years later, it was suspension and transfer to another school within the same board. That's called exporting the problem internally. Then it became suspension and uh, permission to resign so that the teacher could apply for a job at another board. That's exporting externally the problem. Now, thank goodness, where a teacher is found to have committed such sexual misconduct and is fired, when uh, the, and, and applies subsequently to another board for employment, that board must make inquiries of the firing board about why that teacher was fired. In other words, there's a compelled disclosure of the event so that we will no longer export these things around the province or around the country, as the case may be. Um, what are we, just about 30 minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, I've cut some things out. I could probably stand here the next hour, but I would collapse and I'm sure you would <laughs> fall asleep. But in any event, against the background of, of what I told you and what I wanted to tell you, enjoy this extraordinary piece of work. I'd be interested in your comments afterwards. Um, and as I say, if, if what I've said alters in any way the insight that you, you bring to it, then I've done my job and I'm looking forward to, to see what my reaction will be because I've never seen such, such a circumstance portrayed in this way. And now until I guess the curtain goes up, we're gonna, let's throw it open. I, I've always found that I learn a lot more than you guys do with the question and answer period. And please uh, uh, invite the Gord to participate in this. Oh, I'll join you, John. Huh? I'll stand up. Oh, he's going to go. I would like to make a comment on it because I saw the tape. And I think it's very moved by it. I am an adult educator myself. And my reaction was that that play of a text of it ought to be in the syllabus of every family life and sex education curriculum in the country. Thank you very much. I don't think you get higher praise than that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's from my heart. And, it, 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 um, and I also, many years ago, took a course at the University of Waterloo on family life and sex education. And so I'm talking from that aspect of it too. It's a contentious issue now in Ontario, sex education, and how far it should go. I didn't even thought of that. You're right. And it's even more tough. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a couple of questions, comments. Um, speaking about, uh, I wasn't aware of this, the uh, relationship with the teacher student being in local parentes and having no aim to limit got me thinking, and with the strict liability, which is very, very high, whereas in normal cases, it's the other way around. It brought to mind a few things for me. Um, what about extending that to children, especially in other situations? For example, I have kids, and my child goes to the way to sleepover camp every summer for two months. That is a much longer time period where the counselors and the uh, staff are not held to that strict liability. Another situation, especially where we're thinking about uh, people who have 
really control, I think, is, is what was, um, you know, in local parents, it's somebody who has control, people in authority. What about um, other professions? Massage therapists, uh, psychologists, uh, gynecologists, you know, where a person is in a vulnerable state. Um, those people are not held to a strict liability. And my other, so that was one area of concern I had. Um, my other area of concern was, I think you're talking just about uh, physical, sexual. Physical, sexual, and I'm wondering, what about strict psychological abuse? And then my last comment was, what about rape victims? You know, we hear so much in society about women being raped, and they are they don't afford the same protection. You know, they have the struggle of not having the strict liability. They have to prove their case, and they today, you know, they have the struggle and they don't come forward. Yet in this one particular situation, um, and this certain group is being afforded uh, a special status because of the relationship. And, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just raising the issue. I mean, we have the, um, what is it, the whistleblower protection law, right? And, and this sort of seems to to me like that. So I'm just raising these issues. Yeah. Well, that's about four courses of law school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try it. And then, sure, we're one. You mentioned the camp setting? Yeah. In fact, that the, the standard is identical. Oh, is In it? fact, the strict liability concept came from the residential camp setting. It started in British Columbia, and uh, 15 years ago, there were two decisions coming out of one was a camp setting, and the other was a uh, a school with residents where the, where the, the student was in residence. And that and that that's the added component in local parentis, not from 9 a.m. to 3:30, but from 12 to 12 as well. And in that case, all, all that needed to be proven was that the event occurred and it immediately <coughs> shift. So, so again, now, the real question I think perhaps may be is do, do camps acknowledge that, uh, that obligation and do they act accordingly? The camps that I know of, uh, that my kids have gone to or my one son was a director of for three years, they are well aware of that, and they take very. My, my when my son was director of Camp Maple Leaf, the protocol that he had whenever this, when there was a, just a whiff of this, was quite extraordinary, and frank and frankly, would, could be a model for the education. As for the other things, the other professions, I've told you, my I've got a strict liability. If I have a, a, a if I have a, a client come and make an allegation to the law society about sexually molesting, abusing, or Harassing. I'm, I'm in practical terms. I'm guilty until I can disprove that. Medical profession is as high, if not higher, than teaching. So, again, the, and I think you put your your finger on it. Where the degree of control and influence is at its highest, the standard of care is at its highest, and it's high, just as high in the medical nursing professions as it is for the education. The other stuff, I'm, I'm so tired now, I forgot what your other points were. But in any event, but you make a very good point, is that as, as a group of society, we're not aware of that. Anyway, I think, Madam. Thank you. I just want to briefly mention an instance of um, that I, a good friend of mine in high school, um, age 15, was, um, was in a sexual relationship with an English teacher. Um, he wasn't moved. They lived together. Um, he wasn't moved to another board. He wasn't in censured in any way. Um, he went on to drop her, move to another school board, find another, I'm going to call her victim, did the same thing again, uh, not censured in any way. And she, my friend went on to commit suicide. 
So this yeah, I asked when that. This was in the 1960s and early yeah. 70s. Yeah. That, that so is. That's that, an example of what one human being that I personally know um, experienced from this issue. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't have said that anymore or as eloquently. And that, by the way, was too common an experience in the 60s. The teacher, I mean, it was always the teacher having the benefit of the doubt. And that's why there are profound feelings of guilt uh, by a victim. You know, it, it's my fault. That, that's, the, that's the baggage from the 60s and the 70s. All I can say, and it's of no comfort, <coughs> that wouldn't happen today in a heart. And I tell you, if it does, I think knowing this premier as I do, if she found a school board that had so dealt with the matter today, she'd take that school board over and she'd clean out those that are that, that are that allow that to happen. I, I, I don't know of a school board in any sector of this province today that would allow that to happen. That guy or person would be gone at the first sign and wouldn't come back. Because I, and I when these things are defended, they're defended by the union and agreements and arbitration. And, and again, the, the onus is reversed then. I, I, as acting for a school board, the employer, I got to prove that I was, that my client was justified in firing. And if I don't prove it, that guy gets his job back. But I have a common, I have a common submission that I make to these boards of arbitration. When it's a tough, when it's a tough case, I say, you know what? We're not letting that guy back. If that guy comes back to our school, in our classrooms, you've done it. And when it happens again, we're going to come and see you. And I don't know how effective it is, but again, I'm bragging. I've never lost one of those cases. Not because of that, because the facts are. Sorry, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm a retired teacher. And, uh, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, and I think I started teaching in the 80s, and I can just agree with you that things were very, very different then than they are now. Um, but in the early 2000s, just to give some of you a sense of, of how things changed, we were given strict guidelines that were well enforced. We were no longer allowed to email a student. We were no longer allowed to give extra help to one student in a room with a closed door. The doors had to be open. You were supposed to be in the presence of more than one person at a time. We were not allowed to drive students anywhere. Um, the, the, level of strictness was really, really changed. And although there were times when, as a teacher that wanted to reach out to students, I found it very difficult, I still think that the protection was, was crucial. And, and those changes were very, very evident as we came into the 21st century. It's not that I think that it solves all the problems or protects all the children, but it certainly made some difference. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. And I, and I wish I could say in response that that was the proactive thinking of your union. No. It wasn't. No, it was to defend because itself. the province passed a piece of legislation in 2001 from, and one of it created the Ontario College of Teachers. And what did the College of Teachers do in 2002? It enacted a strict guideline telling in very explicit terms what teachers had to do and what boards had to do in these circumstances. And now, of course, when you look at the procedures of the unions, it parents that. So, you know, I, the, the, the teaching federations in this province were dragged, kicking, and screaming for the current circumstance. They don't like to hear that, but regrettably, that's the way it was. Yes, ma'am. Well, what about kindergarten teachers hugging their children? Yeah. See, that's, that, see that, 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 that's, the, that's the baggage. My wife's a teacher. My wife was started teaching in 1970. She still does it. Occasionally, and when this went on through the 2000s, her, her biggest lament was, and she taught uh, special education to primary age kids. Her big lament was, I really gotta be careful. If I'm gonna lay on any hands, I better do it with somebody else in the room, and even with somebody else in the room, I'm at risk. And yes, there has been a physical separation between the teaching profession, particularly primary teaching, and students. But you know what? I think that's a price worth paying to protect those like you experienced in the, in the 1960s. Um, I, 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 I've yet to be persuaded that 
not laying on hands makes any real difference with pedagogy. Yes, ma'am. Playing devil's advocate. Uh oh. You're you're guilty until you're proven innocent. What about teachers that are wrongly accused and their lives are ruined, their families' lives are ruined? I mean, there are some kids that have very active imaginations and what what happens? Like Well, you've said it. Their lives are ruined. Because it's not it's not the truth of the allegation that does the damage. It's the allegation. And once, and, and, and the only positive response I can make to that is, I, I can't tell you how many I've done. I can't tell you how many I've helped investigate and, and, and assisted the board in making the decision on discipline. I haven't yet, I've yet to come across one that was a false accusation. The biggest one, the most egregious one, happened in this city. A high school I won't name. But the teacher was the head of the music department, and he was an icon in the music community. <laughs> um, he was so popular and well thought of that parents were transferring their kids wherever in the city, to his course, so that he could help them get scholarships to U.S. universities. That's how high he was. There was a community of parents designed to court to him. And the director of education, whom I knew for, I've known for a long time, the day after the March break, this particular year, her assistant said there's a mother come here to see you. Will you see her? And of course, I mean, usually a reaction would be, well, I don't have a, I don't have an appointment. Not. Anyway, this director uh, brought that mother in. And the mother told a story about what her son had disclosed to her over the March break. And the scenario was this. This music teacher had a cabin that he flew to in his plane on weekends and on holidays, and he took four to six boys every time for work weekends. You know, chop wood, cut the grass, break the leaves. <laughs> and invariably, Saturday night, the alcohol and the drugs came up, unbeknownst to, well, alcohol, beknownst to the students, all under age, the drugs not so. And that's when the sexual assaults occurred. Well, that director had the courage that day to send that teacher home and send a letter to the parents of that community. And that's when all hell broke loose. You know what I'm talking about. I know don't exactly you? who and when it went. And I went with that director the next day to meet with the, with the teachers in the staff room. And that's one of the very few times in my career I've been afraid for my sake and for hers. We had to actually escape, literally escape. That's how vault, that's how vitriol and strong the feelings were against the victims. And of course the rhetoric was he's gonna fight the hardest, he's got the best luck. Guess what happened on the day of trial? He pleaded guilty to six counts and went to jail. Um, I forget what the question was. <laughs> Forgive the emotion, but that's that that doesn't happen to me. That should have happened in the sixties and not <laughs> sorry. Yes, sir. Is there a level of consent that exonerates? No. It's absolutely if you have if you if you if you conduct yourself in any in a way just defined by any of these sexual offenses of the criminal code and the student is under 16, absolute liability. The only exception in the criminal code, wise one, is there is a defense if you as the accused are within two years, you're, old, you're within two years older than the, the teacher, the, the, the student. Fortunately, I don't think there'd be any 20 year old well, I shouldn't say never, never say never, but it would be a really interesting 
trial if the student was 21 and the teacher was 23, but let's not go there. No, no, sir, there isn't. The second question. Uh, you talk about all these people coming forward and pleading guilty. Is it possible that there was plea bargaining involved? We've heard about plea bargaining. That, I, I know there was plea bargaining involved because, because their charges were, in the one case of the music guy, he had 18 charges against them. Because guess what? When that first, when, when that first, when, when the information came out about what the allegation, the first allegation, victims came forward. And the support group was created. It wasn't planned, but, a, but the support group of victims was created. So, yeah, yeah. I saw a hand, I think. Well, I just yes. wondered, um, I know in my community just recently, similar thing happened. But the kids were 13 then, and they're like 60 now. So they're how much? 60, quite older now. Six zero? Yeah, well, just wonder oh, about That's the, a really good question. About they're, the memory of like how... Well, that's another issue. You may have heard of the concept of false memory. Yeah. And in Canadian law, there's something called a limitation period. And it's a period of time within which you must, as a plaintiff, sue the defendant. And if you wait beyond that, you out of luck. The general limitation period is two years for this type of situation. But fortunately, our Supreme Court of Canada, about 15 years ago, said that the limitation period for a victim that does not have a memory or a full recollection of the event it doesn't start until that full memory recollection comes forward. Um, and so, I mean, okay. you may, I mean there, I know of cases where uh, victims assaulted uh, at ages 12, 13, 14 have sued the teacher 35, 40 years later, and that teacher's gone to jail. Well, this is the case yeah. in our community. And that's how it should be. And, and again, some people say, well, that's not fair. You know, two, if 40 years goes by, no, no, sorry. As long as that victim acts within the two years, that lawsuit should be allowed to proceed. I just wanted to ask, how did you come to pick this as a topic to break the label? Um, uh, uh, I'm interested in where human emotion is going to evolve with legality. And um, I was curious about a character because every single turn 40, two years ago. And uh, uh, I guess had a lot of uh, thoughts of mortality. I started looking into male midlife crisis and how people start to do desperate things when they reach kind of middle age. And so I wanted to create a character who was grappling with something that was feeling overwhelming. Um, and I wanted to have it in a public context. And I wanted it to be a force that is everybody can learn to do something that's powerful, such as sexual impulses or love impulses. In the world. Um, and uh, I started thinking about this teacher character. I went to the Ontario College of Teachers hearings and I started listening in on, on those hearings. I was interested in the way lawyers talk about it, the way it's phrased, the way the charges come out, how clinical you know. And if I were to give all the sympathy I could to this very unlikable, what many people would consider a monstrous character, but given as much sympathy as I could to draw out the arguments from the other characters, I could create something that would be um, provocative in a way. So that's what so my, the, the, there's one line in the play, I will share it with you now, but it's an exchange between husband and wife that says it all about what this guy should have done. He is, he is a, Gordon does an incredible job, he is a sympathetic character. And I, it pains me to hear that he just described himself as in mid play. <laughs> <laughs> day of my life, other than my parents dying, is my 40th birthday. I thought life was over. I haven't had a problem since. I don't know why. I woke up and it was a Sunday morning and I said, God, I'm 40. Is that all, you know, all those cliches? And I was really bumped out until my wife threw a surprise party at a Spanish restaurant for me that night. And I drank it away. But, but you can adapt as, as a male. 
who's past that and gone through it, you can identify with that. And and you'd be lying to say, I'd be lying to say, because I I I well, no, I'll make it even closer. I have become very close emotionally and professionally to many of these victims. I had one, the most difficult one, sorry, they're all difficult. I had one where the only way that her plight was discovered, she wrote an essay at night school, and the English teacher looked at that essay and said, that's not fiction. And it evolved from there. She did, she got victimized, not by one teacher, by two. And the first one held out to her, as soon as you're 18, we're going at it. 18th birthday, they went at it in his basement, and he then discarded her. To seek comfort from her pain, she went to teacher number two. And she showed up at his doorstep, Christmas Eve. And what did he do after two bottles of wine? You can imagine. And it was, and she didn't want to come forward. She didn't, but circumstances made her come forward. I don't think I've ever been as close to a client as I have with her. And she stuck it out. She was cross-examined for five days oh by the God. union's lawyer, and she didn't blink. And he was, both of them, where the, the, the termination was upheld by both of them. And in both cases, if they had any credibility at the time, it was decimate. So years go by. She was about 21 when we had those cases. Years go by. I get an invitation in the mail to her wedding, which I wanted to go to, but then I thought, man, alive. of all of the days, she does not want to be reminded about what went on and the, who's the guy that's going to remind her. So I said her, uh, a nice present. What happened? Two weeks? No, two months ago. I'm on LinkedIn. Check me out. She contacts me. Just wanted to see how you're doing. Are you still alive? Uh, I'd love to get together with you. And you know, this time I'm going to follow up on it. Uh, I, profound. I don't know what that was in response to, but but again, but but Gord has a. You can't do a better job of creating a sympathetic character in this context than what he's done. And I'm not saying that because he's here and he's bigger than me. I don't <laughs> I don't give flattery out to where it's not to sort of yes, Well, please. you would be concerned, so would you, about um, contacting her? Um, would they be in terms of a professional? No, ability? no, because I would not have sought her out ever. Right. But because she has sought me out, it's and it would have been improper for me to go to her sure wedding, yeah. because and her mother and father, to the best of my knowledge, never knew about this. It was all done in secret, in secrecy from them. And, uh, and, and if I had been there, the question's got to be asked, who's he and what's he doing there? So, but the fact that she has sought me out, the heck, so many years have gone by, and she's married, and I think she doesn't matter. I'm going to have coffee with her. She saved her. Yeah, she saved her. Saved her. Well, no, don't give me that much credit. <laughs> I had a hand in it, perhaps, but... I think it's um, amazing how uh, people will talk about um, menopause with women, but they don't talk about menopause in men. And I thought that the hero, the main character in that way, was what that was what he was going through, was on how male menopause. <laughs> No, I think, I mean, I, I think, I, I, I don't know, maybe I have further midlife crisis to come. I, I, <laughs> but I certainly feel you like, you know, when I, when I first uh, tasted it, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the butt of jokes. And I understand that we live in a, in a patriarchal society, I believe. And, you know, uh, the idea of a man stumbling on his uh, age is uh, something uh, funny, whereas uh, a, a woman is perhaps something not funny, whereas I kind of think, well, it's not necessarily funny. It's not funny to the person who's experiencing it, and it's not funny to the people who it affects when they start to die. Uh, anybody, any other human who starts to grapple with mortality starts to make choices with other people in a way that affects them, often negatively, at a time of panic. Um, so I, I hope that I've treated it humanely. Uh, I've, I've embraced as many gray areas as I can uh, in order to make it a thought. Thank you.
not to reveal personal items, but before, one of the questions I was able to ask Gordon before we started, whether he had any girls as children. And I'll let him answer if he wishes, but I have my eldest as a, as a, as a girl. And I can tell you, when I went through those things, that had a real impact on me. And I wore a lot of that because I would internalize and visualize that it, she was the victim. It made me fight harder, but it also took more out of me. Um, and, it, you know, I mean, gender is irrelevant. It can happen in any context. And, and if, it, if it had, I guess it would have been bad. I have two boys, but I have friends who have girls. so. One came to see the show. We've both seen the show, um, but I think we're all, I mean, they're all, they're affected in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, whether you have girls or boys, you're still trying to protect innocent people. And everybody, you know, it's, uh, uh, I'm not interested in, in villains. I'm interested in people behaving in extraordinary ways. Um, that's, that's how I approach the area of the which uh, as a writer as well. I think it creates something more. Have you had any reactions from school boards? Uh, no, I haven't. The, uh, the, the sort of most professional, sort of lawyerly reaction I've had is from John. Because I heard that um, that the theater had approached the school board, uh -huh. and they said no, they didn't want to. And the woman who told me has just left, so I can't. Uh, 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 one of my clients is the Ontario Public School Board Association. And that's an association of trustees of boards, all of whom are adults. I haven't said this to anybody, but one of the things I'm going to do when they're open for business, I'm going to call the executive director. I'm going to tell her about this play. I'm going to demand that she go and see it. And I'm going to then demand that she seriously consider recommending to her board that this become required, uh, that required attendance by trustees. Because this this play can have and would have profound influence within the education community. You see, this is something that parents ought to uh, tell their children about. But I have found that so many of them do not understand the gift of sex, and so it's not it comes out um, in, in peer group and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think sex is no matter what it's a very uh, uh, difficult uh, question for people to become articulate, um, which is unfortunate. Which is like family life and sex education. Also, we started in junior I just want to insert something here that John today has very kindly said. Following the play, should anyone wish to talk to him, I suggest that. Um, right by the little concession there, there's a little area with two couches where people could conveniently sit after the play today, should you wish to continue this conversation, which definitely doesn't feel over. But because the doors are now open to the theater downstairs, we have to say goodbye. But thank you, George.